Welcome to How Did You Do It, our space to get to know the people behind great ideas. Whether you're on your morning walk, heading to work or relaxing at home, enjoy your daily dose of inspiration awaits. Hey everyone and welcome back to How Did You Do It? I'm Georgia. I'm Gabby. We really hope everyone is keeping well. We're super excited about today's episode. We sat down with Josh Howard, the founder of Single Use Ain't Sexy, which is a brand I'm sure you've all seen on your Instagram feeds. If you aren't aware though, Single Use Ain't Sexy sells Just Add Water cleaning and personal care products designed to eradicate single use plastic bottles. So since launching in 2019, Josh has contributed to 125,000 plastic bottles being saved from landfill. It's an amazing Aussie brand that's sleek sexy and environmentally conscious so grab your earphones go for a walk and enjoy the episode hi josh it's a pleasure to have you on thank you guys good to be here we're so excited to get into it so we'd love to know a bit about your backstory maybe let's start by seeing what you did after high school oh my god i used to be a lawyer officially but i never ever practiced law um, because i would never been happy so when I left school, I did that because I didn't know what I wanted to do. And it was like really one of those things where I just did study law because I got into it. I thought it was like hard to get into, so I should like take the opportunity. Um, but really just like hated, hated studying it. Um, and so I was also studying arts, which was great. I studied major in international politics. Um, and then when I finished my law degree, I was working at Delhi at uni and a mate of mine who worked in the deli with me was like, oh, my auntie works in TV. They're looking for a production assistant on The Mole, which was a reboot of this like, reality show from about 15 years ago. And he was like, they're going to be travelling around Australia for three, for three months. Like, she needs just like a young person to help out. Would you be interested? And I was like, yeah, I'd be interested. I have no idea what I want to do. That sounds like way more fun than being a lawyer, like being in an office or being on a TV set, which is travelling around. And so then I kind of got into TV and media and production and all that kind of stuff. And so that's what I did for the first few years after, after uni as I worked in TV and learned all about like the Aussie media landscape and how do big media companies are run and what sells and how to, how to sell ideas and TV shows. And it just really helped me figure out like the marketing side of my brain and how to market and how to connect with people on kind of different media platforms and all that kind of stuff. So that is really helping me kind of build my business now because I think every business is basically a content business as you guys will figure out because you've got a podcast and every business is about like marketing to a specific, very, I think niche demographic of people and figuring out like what messaging works with them and how to be authentic and how to really kind of like find a sweet spot. So Interesting how those experiences that have nothing to do with what I'm doing now actually are really helpful. Yeah, I was going to ask because I'm, I'm sure, yeah, it adds major value even just to starting something to have that knowledge and that experience is always valuable. What took you from that path of being in media and that whole world and then shifting that into starting a sustainability company? It's a really good question. I've always been obsessed with how to like connect with people both just like from a personal kind of friend perspective and also like from a commercial marketing psychology perspective, like how do you connect with people in a way that feels legit um, and how you do it within a community of people that want what you're selling. So I think the important thing for me was seeing how the Australian media landscape connected with over, you know, maybe two or three million people every night who were sitting on their couch at that time still watching like linear TV and then figuring out how half their time was taken up by the content, so by the show that was on, and then half their time or maybe a little bit less than half was taken up by ads. And I always found it fascinating that basically these two like parallel sectors, which is content and ads, make every platform work and probably have in the history of media. So if you think about it, like one won't exist without the other, and even if you look at models like Netflix where there's no ads, you're paying a subscription, which is the commercial element to it. So it's, you still have the commerciality and then also the entertainment, which I guess is why they call it like show business. And so I started getting fascinated with like how you could marry up 
content, which is meant to be like fun and engaging and entertaining and exciting, but with a business. So how do you actually then make a living out of that? How do you have something to sell people? And so the thing I love about direct to consumer brands like mine, which is obviously like a sustainability brand. So it's in a specific niche in itself is like, how do you marry up trying to sell people something that we think the world needs? It's not just like more useless crap. So all our stuff's like reusable and refillable, but then doing it in a way that's like fun and irreverent and cheeky and engaging by making really good content. And so that that is kind of how I slowly transitioned out of media and into, I call it like D2C brands, like direct-to-consumer brands. So where you're creating, it's it's similar to like, TV production in the sense that you're creating a whole world, which is your brand and your business, and then you're selling that out to the community and you're competing with everyone else who's trying to do the same thing. So it's, it feels maybe like it's a bit of a stretch, but it was a very natural transition into this from that kind of media world. So interesting. I'm so excited to hear a bit more about how you did like conceptualize the brand and the product. But before we get into that, I'd love to kind of focus on the issue. So there's so much awareness about how bad plastic is for the planet and there is pressure on governments and companies to be held accountable and make change but what was it for you that made you want to individually tackle that issue that's a really good question because i feel like we're all getting bombarded with a million messages now like almost on the daily about like sustainability and the environment so i think the issue sometimes can be is that the issues around sustainability and climate change and global warming and single-use plastic consumption can feel so big and overwhelming that they feel like you can't make a difference. There's a term for it, which I actually kind of feel like described me and a lot of us, which is eco-anxiety. So it's this sense that the issues are so bad that you feel helpless to kind of solve them. And so I wanted to create a business and a product which made you feel like you actually were having a tangible impact whilst also actually having a tangible impact. And feeling like you're doing something and actually doing them are two separate things. And I think that we are all allowed to want both of those. You want to, you want to do good and you also want to feel like you're doing good. And so for me, it was like looking at the space and thinking, all right, so how can we create like a really fun brand that was talking about a serious issue? So a lot of the times, like I I talk about our brand as being like serious fun. It's like dealing with a a significant issue. Like I think the, the, the greatest problem of our time which I think is climate change and then dealing with it in a way that's fun because the last thing anyone wants is to get like guilted or shamed into having to do the right thing. I think, you know, you remember when, you know, you're a little kid and your parents tell you to do something. So you just do the opposite just because you just want to be a little shit. Basically I feel it's the same way, especially with companies like no one wants to be told that what they're doing is bad and they need to do better. So I think the positioning around, this issue is about making something fun and then you're pulling people towards you like that rather than making them feel badly about what they're doing. And so I very much looked at this situation with that through that lens and thought, okay, there's a big white space here for a brand that's trying to be more sustainable and eco-friendly, but which is also really fun and funny and looks sexy. I love the idea of sustainability looking sexy. Mm. And so I think like the future of sustainability from a consumer brand point of view is making stuff that is eco-friendly but which looks really cool. Mm. And so it's about being like design-led rather than people feeling like they have to compromise on something looking good just to do better. Yeah, definitely. And you can see it in the brand and the product. I love the font and like the way it sits on the sleek white bottle. It's it's so eye-catching yet it's so just like sleek. Um, how did you initially conceptualise doing hand soap and and going into that? I've always been obsessed with, uh, like I call it the Just Add Water category. So it's about basically not shipping water because the idea of shipping water, as you guys can probably imagine, is just so insane when it's coming out of your tap at home and you're already paying for it. And it's, it's not free, but it's, it's, not, it's not that expensive if you think about how much water each household uses. And so, like, I, I've always loved the idea of trying to get people to harness that as a resource where they want to use it, which is where you make our soap. And then I was looking around at different categories of product around the house and I was like, all right, so what categories are all liquid-based but are being shipped in their full form, right? So if you think about a bottle of hand soap, 
got one of our bottles here. It's like, you know, a normal bottle of liquid hand soap is like 95% water. And so what we're doing is just distilling the raw ingredients down into a tablet form. And so when we were looking at what to do, like look at what, what's in the house. Like you have chicken stock cubes that you, you mix with water. You might have, some people might have powdered cordial. You might have denture cleaning tablets. My grandparents used to use those. You might, you know, there's other things that maybe you don't use all the time, but you use when you go camping, maybe powdered potato mash, maybe powdered milk. As a kid, we had those little sponge things that were like dinosaurs and you pour water on them and they expand. So there's all different ways that we could have cut it. I felt like hand soap was good because it is a category of product that we use on a daily basis. Um, this was just before COVID. So obviously people washing their hands even more now, but, but in a normal world, people still washing their hands. And I just felt like it was one of those products that we could be impactful about because it's just getting used so often. So the more something gets used, it means more plastic soap bottles ending up in landfill, which means the environmental impact is worse, which means there's a bigger opportunity for us. So that's kind of how we, how we set it on in the end. And I thought hand soap's a good one to start with because it touches your body. And so anything that touches your body, you've got a more intimate personal connection with than say a cleaning product maybe touching the top of your bench and I thought that having that personal connection the touch was a really cool way to make people feel like they're connected with the brand to, to, to begin with for the first product. So you've had all these realizations and you've thought up these really cool products um, but what actually made you take the leap into creating single use Aim Sexy? Well I've always been someone who has love the idea of just like not having to confer with other people to do stuff. Like I just have an idea. I just want to do it. I don't have to ask a million people for their opinions or their approvals, all this stuff. So I thought this is great because it's marrying up my love of sustainability with my own desire to be more eco-friendly. And then the possibility of spreading that even wider, if we can turn it into a real business. Cause it started cause I was just chucking out so many plastic bottles. I was looking at my bin and under my sink and I'm like, oh my God, this is a nightmare. And this is just one household. That means every household in Australia, every household in the world is just burning through plastic bottles. So then I was like, all right, like we, I got to find a manufacturer basically. So who can I find that can do this? And then I, I spoke, I counted the other day, I spoke to over 90 manufacturers, I think around 92, 93 manufacturers. So it was about going to either a soap factory that could turn it into a tablet or a tablet factory that could turn it into a soap. And that was really hard. And it's like kind of a little bit like soul destroying because you just like another call with someone saying they can't do it or another person knocking you back. And it's just like, ah, uh, you just got stuck on a little bit nuts. But we got there and we found a manufacturer that could do it. And then we got different versions and samples and changed some, you know, stuff around and all that kind of thing. Um, and so that was a big one is finding a manufacturer that could do it. Um, and we did. And it kind of all slowly started to come to life. And it's cool. Like, you know, you have an idea and you want to try and create something and in your head. You can see it, but like no one else can. Not that people aren't encouraging. Like people are definitely like being so supportive, but you just, you, you know, when you know something can be a certain way, you can like see it before it's there. Mm. And you are kind of like obsessively trying to like move the world towards that product being you know, in existence and needed and wanted. So it's been very much that process of like having the idea and then executing it. And that's probably one of the things to, to your question at the start that I love most about is it feels really creative. And I feel like if you have your own business, in some ways the business is like, you, like you're an artist in charge of shaping your business. And so you can be really creative with like all the different directions you take it take it into and I'm not just meaning like the aesthetic things like branding and bottles like I just mean the creativity around partnerships and ambassadors and how to structure it and how you're going to finance it and all that kind of stuff logistics it's like a really creative endeavor so I think one of the things that I've enjoyed about continuing to do this is that I constantly keep getting to be creative as the business grows but it's just the creativity evolves and changes as, as the nature and size of the business does as well does that make sense? Yeah, a hundred percent. No, it's, it's awesome. And do you see um, single use and sexy expanding into other products and diversifying as well? Yes. Yeah. hundred percent. So 
the, the, the first product that we've got is the dissolvable hand soap tablets. So the way it works, just, just if people don't know, is we have these sexy matte white glass bottles that I'm holding for anyone who's watching this, uh, the video of this. Um, you fill it with tap water from your tap, warm tap water, and then you drop one of our white dissolving tablets in. So it's almost like a Barocca tablet, but for hand soap. That tablet dissolves, and then you give it about 20 minutes, and then you pump the dispenser, and it comes out as this beautiful thick white foam that you guys can see now that you wash your hands with, like normal hand soap. Then when you're done, instead of chucking a plastic soap bottle into landfill, you fill our glass one back up with tap water, drop another tablet in, and the whole cycle starts again. So it's circular. Um, one of these can save up to 25 single-use plastic soap bottles from landfill each year. So the idea has been start with the hand soap and make the hand soap famous. I'm obsessed with the idea of making products famous, which is probably my TV background coming into it, is I saw how people, which, you know, in that world you call talent, I saw how when you make talent famous, you increase the value of the talent and then you increase the value of the business. So I've tried to go and make our products famous so that people know single-use sexy, single-use saint sexy, and it's almost like a status symbol for sustainability, just the way that ASOP is a status symbol for design when you see it on, on someone's, you know, kitchen bench top or bathroom sink. And so for us now, it's about expanding into different scents and fragrances of our hand soap and then also bringing out different tablet-based products in the personal care vertical, so anything that touches your body, and then the home cleaning vertical, so anything that touches your home. And so for us, I think it's about building a huge tablet-based cleaning and personal care system that can eradicate all of your single-use plastic uh, bottles around the home. So that's like the broader vision is to build a, a global scalable company uh, with, with that kind of structure beneath it. Yeah, I was going to ask you, are your um, soaps currently fragranced? Any yes, soap? at the moment, at the moment, our um, soap is fragranced with aloe essence, yeah. um, which has been good because it's it's like, it smells very sweet. I think it smells like a baby's head, but we couldn't really put that <laughs> as the fragrance. Like, so, <laughs> weird. Um, so it's like nice, very soft on, on the skin because of the aloe essence. Um, we're about to launch t two new fragrances, which is really exciting. So doing big collaborations with different partners for those. Um, and then it, it'll be about bringing out, you know, products like body wash, face wash, shampoo, other, other things in the personal care vertical, um, and then home cleaning products. So it's just fun. Like it's just so much fun being able to, you know, get customer feedback, conduct focus groups, develop products like, work with our manufacturers about like what we think are cool extensions of what we're trying to do and then bring those to market and introduce people to the different products. So I, I always like to say, I think of single use saying sexy as like the gateway drug into sustainability for people. So it's like, it's just, it's just, it's not meant to have to change someone's entire routine or daily life. I just want to kind of frictionlessly integrate into people's lives. And so I think, the idea is that the more products we have, the more we can do that in all different areas of the home, which I think is like a really kind of cool way of looking at it. You've mentioned a lot about how important the aesthetic and design and brand were. Could you kind of go into a bit of detail about how you went about building that brand? I think that the branding side of any business is like so crucial. And I think especially in the sustainability space, what, you're, what you have now is a massive movement of people who want to be more eco-friendly, but they might not be like the obsessed off-the-grid eco-warriors that, you know, are going to change their entire lives to, to fit your product into it. It's about us fitting into them rather than us fitting into to us. Um, and so I think it's about making design-led, really cool, sexy, beautiful products that are also eco-friendly. Like I always like to say... I want to build a business where people are using our products, even if they didn't know they were eco-friendly because they're, they're cool. And so I think that's the kind of direction we've tried to take things is make it cool as well as sustainable. And so that meant that the brand had to be a certain way. Like the look is the bottles are glass. They are matte white. They are really beautiful and soft to touch. They, they look like they're almost like, a fashion accessory. And so we've marketed our business as a fashion brand 
And I think that's been one of the keys to our success is that we're not marketing ourselves as a sustainability brand or a soap brand. It's, it's about like the design aesthetic. And so the name is a really important piece of that puzzle as well. Single Use Ain't Sexy is a name that on the surface seems like a bit of a mouthful, but it actually makes you want to know more. And one of the fascinating things for me about a name is I think that the name of a business is the single most valuable piece of real estate you could ever create. Um, and it's free. It's just about being creative. And so, you know, when I started the business, I'd come up with all these different names and they were like, they were cool. They were more functional. Like they more kind of described what the product did, you know, like drop or dip or, you know, all these things that evoke the tablet going to water or whatever. And I was like, hang on, none of this is emotional. It's not like making people stop in their tracks and thinking like, I want to know more about that. So I think, for me, the name, the big, the big lesson has been make, make your name just awesome. Do you know what I mean? Like make it so that people have to know more because otherwise what will happen is people find out about your brand and they're just like, all right, next. Like I've seen like a million other ads on Instagram today or whatever. And so it's really important to like create different touch points of the brand that always kind of make people feel. So our tagline is don't be a tosser, for example, Right. And so that's another one where I was like, all right, our tagline could be something boring, like wash your hands or just add water, which I still think is valuable in other ways for us to use. And we use that line, but not as like the line, you know? So it's, it's about creating a brand that keeps like cutting through and making people feel like you're a specific way. And I think like I was saying before about us differentiating ourselves from other like sustainability players, that the brand is, is the most obvious and noticeable and visible way for us to do that. Um, and so I'm really, really happy with how we've evolved the brand and we still have heaps of work to do. Like it's just such a moving beast, this, this business. So we, we just want to keep evolving the brand as, as well as the rest of the business and our product range and our demographic and how we market to people. But yeah, the brand is definitely something that we've put a lot of time and effort into, but I think it's really like, it's really paid off from a, from a kind of like a cultural perspective, it's about creating like a cultural connection with people, I reckon. Definitely. It's, it's, I love the name. It's, it's so modern and fresh and it is captivating like straight away. And I love how single you saint sexy is like a reinforcing statement in itself as well as a brand. It's like, you've kind of got your messaging and your name in like one coherent mold, which is really cool. Um, what have been your biggest kind of challenges in creating single you saint sexy? Oh my God. Uh, people don't like, a lot, a lot of like people I know don't like when I say this because they think it's like, you've got to keep the facade up that you are like a pro at everything, but like you just, you just screw up so much. It's unbelievable how many mistakes and missteps you make. And it's, it's just like so unrelenting how many opportunities there are to make mistakes. Now, like I'm someone who's like quite hard on myself and I really want us to like create an amazing and a special business here. So it's hard to be self-reflective in that way because you're always looking at your own mistakes and even your own successes maybe differently to how other people are. Um, and by that, I mean, sometimes people are like, oh, it's amazing, you know, you guys did this and you're like, oh yeah, of course, I didn't even take the time to, you know, give us like a pat on the back for that because all I'm doing is stressing about other stuff. But we've had some, we've had some really good wins um, and some really good successes. So we raised, um, we, a few weeks ago, we closed an equity crowdfund. So we did our first capital raise and we raised $600,000 in two days. So it was the fastest record, um, equal fastest ever on the virtual platform, which I think is probably Australia's leading equity crowdfunding platform. And so it was, it was interesting validation to me that despite all the mistakes, despite all the missteps, all the lessons, that we're actually building something that people really, really like and that people want to invest in themselves. And so I think the big lessons have been that even if you screw stuff up, it's, it's, it's probably because they, they just don't work. And so you had to give them a crack to make sure that maybe you're then putting time and effort and resources and money into other stuff. 
And so that could be a big partnership. It could be a product that you think is going to really hit that no one really gets around. It could be maybe you've um, screwed up your marketing messaging or how to really connect with people. So the thing that I like about stuff not working is it, it, it deviates you back onto a path that does work. But the, the thing that I think a lot of people don't share is that it takes trying heaps of stuff that doesn't work to find the few things that do. Like way more stuff doesn't work. Do you know what I mean? Like there's way more, there's way more times when you try stuff and it just falls flat than something working. You know, it might be you try every 10 things, you try one thing goes really well, but the outside world only sees the, the things that go well because they're the things that you push hard. Do you know what I mean? Like no one sees maybe the bad brand messaging that we've done because if it's not working, we'll pull those ads and then we'll just put, put, put time and effort into the ads that do work. So everyone's seeing the ads that do work because they're the ads that do work. So I think I, I'd always say is to anyone who's like young, wanting to start a business, younger wanting to start a business is don't get discouraged by stuff not working because it can feel a little bit unrelenting sometimes the failure or the setbacks you're just like, oh my God, like nothing works. Like this is so ridiculous. Like I can't get anything right, but you actually can, but it takes this like maniacal perseverance, which is like pretty exhausting <laughs> because you just have to keep trying stuff. And so I think that's been, yeah, the big, the big lesson, just keep trying things and eventually certain things will hit. Definitely. Before we start to head in the direction of wrapping up, I'd love to hear what are the next steps? I see this as like a real global business. So I think there's like at the moment we're only available in Australia, but I think there's some, some specific international markets that are really, really interesting for us. Probably, you know, the obvious ones to begin with, like the US and Canada and Europe and the, including the UK, but some markets in Asia as well, specific markets that we think are strategic options for us. So I think building out like a scalable brand that works in different markets and then building out more of a product pipeline so that we can get into different areas of people's homes and lives are probably um, two key focuses for us as well. And I think one of the other big focus in terms of like where we're taking things is it goes a bit back to my last point. It's just to keep trying stuff. Um, so just because some stuff's working, it doesn't mean you stop trying other stuff. It's like, I think it's this endless revolving door of, trying to be as smart and creative and strategic as possible and then see which of those things work. So I think for us is we'll keep scaling the business with that kind of approach and mentality. So I think for us next is pursuing, you know, other markets, refining what we're doing in Australia, pursuing other products, but then constantly trying to be creative about how we execute each of those different parts of our growth strategy. You did touch on it a bit before, but what would be your one major piece of advice for someone wanting to make an idea a reality? Okay, so this is my new obsession in the way I answer this question because I thought a lot about it, is we all get really, really held back by being freaked out that we're going to screw stuff up. So I think the big piece of advice for anyone who's interested is just have a crack. I know you hear this a lot, but I think maybe you hear it a lot because it's really a, a trap that we all fall into, myself included at times, which is we're too scared to do something because we think we're going to screw that up. So we'd rather just not try it and not screw it up. But then you just don't try anything and you never go anywhere. And then you're just like feeling depressed and down about like not ever having like given something a go. So that's the big one is like just just do it, like just do it, like just go out there and just try and you might lose a bit of cash. You don't have to put your entire life savings into something at the start. But like with you guys, like I noticed that, you know, you're starting out just from this chat, like I can already see, like I've, I've loved these questions. I think they're really on the money. Like your style is really nice. Like it's a really easy way to have a conversation maybe because I haven't shut up, but um, <laughs> you know, like, it's, it's awesome just to see you guys starting out and just having a go and just doing something. I don't know anything about your background, but I'm assuming that you guys are friends and that, you know, this is probably an idea that you had and you're like, we can probably do this as well as half the other podcasts that are out there that we're listening to. And so I love anyone, doesn't matter what discipline, what field, what age, who's just out there like having a go at trying to like 
make something happen. So that that would be my advice. I completely agree. It's it's really good advice. It's like Nike, just do it. <laughs> and the same thing, like going back to you saying like people don't see all the back end stuff. We definitely experienced that too with the podcast with like endless breakdowns of being like, what is our name? Like, what's our brand? Like, what's this? And like, it took a year to finally get to like a point where we are now, where it's like, we like the name, we like the style, we have our niche. We know how we want to design yeah. like, so yeah, it is just trial and error and like also just accepting that you might reflect back on like, like we always say we might look at our Instagram in a year's time and be like, what were we thinking? We like, that's not representative of us now, but it's okay. And it's like, just keep pushing forward and, and those things come up. <laughs> totally. Like it's, it's, it's good enough. I think what happens is we get so obsessed with everything having to be like absolutely perfect or it's not like the idealized version of what we think something should be right now that you then are ambivalent to actually persevere because you're like, oh, it doesn't look exactly how I want it. Or our Instagram isn't exactly what I think is like the best Instagram could ever be. But like, you just have to, you just have to start and like everything just gets better. Like if I think about the evolution of our business, like when we start, I look back now, I'm like, oh my God, like our brand was weird. Our aesthetic was weird. Like, yes, we had the same name, but like it had a whole different look and our fonts were different and we had a weird color. And what was I doing? Like, can I tell you something funny just before we wrap up? I actually deleted about maybe nine or 10 months in like every piece of content on our Instagram, every (laughs) single one. And we started again. And so like, you know, like, do you think anyone is now sitting around talking about how the single you saying sexy Instagram used to look like no one even remembers it. Like, you know, in your head, it's like such a big deal, but like everyone's just living their lives and they got their work and their families. And like we over index the importance of our business in like random strangers lives. And I think you've just got to just chill out a little bit about that and just have fun with your own business. Thank you so much for joining us today, Josh. It's been such a great chat. Thanks so much. I should say, I should do a little plug at the end. So that if anyone wants to try our soap, um, they can go to single use ain't sexy, bit of a mouthful, but single use ain't sexy.com. Um, or they can go and follow our journey on Instagram, which is at single use ain't sexy. Uh, and then I would love them if they, they want to check out our soap get around the eco-friendly bandwagon and look sexy while they're doing it then uh, we're, we're the ones for them thanks so much for joining us for another app it was so great to hear about the work josh does and we really hope you enjoyed it yeah and be sure to go follow us on instagram at how did you do it underscore podcast and for any linkedin users it's just how did you do it so thanks so much guys and we'll see you next week